Eric Doom is a small business owner and a startup advisor who wants to make education for Charleston County School students much better. That's why he's running for the Charleston County School Board to represent the students in District 6, West Ashley. I speak explicitly with Eric for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Eric Doom, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, Quentin. It's great to be here. Well, you're very welcome. I know that you are a small business and a startup advisor that obviously connects companies with resources needed to grow. And now you are a candidate for the Charleston County School District School Board to represent the District 6 area, which is basically West Ashley. And I know that obviously, too, you're a small business owner with a background in consulting, uh, sales and engineering. Well, let me ask you this. With all of this experience, Eric, why the Charleston County School Board? Why now? Well, I think a um, number of reasons. My background with education, uh, working with uh, nonprofit reform groups, working to reform the education system in Charleston, be active and get more of our community involved and engaged in all of our children's education. And a pivotal time, I think, for Charleston County School District. We know that this next board will help select and hire the next superintendent, and I think that is pivotal. It is such a critical time to find a uh, truly visionary leader that is engaging and energetic, someone that can come in and help transform the system and work with others within Charleston help um, support services needed to uh, ensure our children are educated, well, safe, and ready for whether it's a day ahead or the next school year and eventually a career in college. Yes, sir. And, and, and I know that this, the Charleston County School Board is right now proposing to basically delegate the majority of its policy decisions to the superintendent. What best practices can come out of this in your mind? Well, I, I see the relationship between a board and superintendent as a partnership and a partnership in advance. And so I think there will be some give and take, but for the majority of decisions, a board should be working on a policy and a guidance level, long-term vision, and entirely around student outcome. And the superintendent has not only those long-term outcomes, but a lot of the administration to work with. And so a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions in uh, ensuring that, you know, not only the student outcomes are looking after or looked after for the long term, the day-to-day -day things to ensure the lights are on and that the, the, the wheels are moving. Um, so I, I think there need to be clear guidelines on what falls within the superintendent's um, review to, to work with um, and what should be you know, worked with on the board. I think that in, um, on the board and working with the board, we stay out of a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions. We we'll empower the superintendent to make the decisions um, and then uh, help hold them accountable. You know, so if results aren't going to where we need them to, have corrective actions. Now, you mentioned the guidance level earlier. What is that guidance uh, level right now, Eric? Uh, to be honest, uh, I'd have to look into that a little more. Um, I think sometimes our board does a great job of setting long-term goals. I think sometimes we set too many goals that are sometimes conflicting and um, distracting. And I think we allow too many non-guidance issues in front of the board and to be part of the time that's spent. So I think we need to work more with the board and hopefully on the board to ensure we're working on the long-term goals and not the things that should be worked at on. And what are those non-issues, particularly for District 6, that are actually coming before the board that should be given towards, say, the superintendent? Uh, I don't have a, a long list of, of current examples, but anything dealing with um, you know, happening inside a school and a classroom, there is a, a hierarchy of management and talent and experts in the school district, people that are, um, you know, uh, talented and, and um, well-meaning employees that um, are in the right place. And if not, we need to work with them to ensure that they have the training to do their job the best they can, the resources to do the best job they can, and in some cases, um, you know, then finding the right people. And I know that earlier I mentioned that you are a small business owner and a startup advisor that connects companies with resources they need to grow. How would you connect District 6 to the school district with resources that they need to have to grow? 
Uh, I think that all of our children in all of our schools across the county deserve to have great outcomes and a great opportunity for equity. And we know that not all of our schools are meeting that standard. And right that the schools that are uh, most require the greatest attention and the greatest and so those within District 6 that need the most remediation to have more opportunities um, with resources and staff uh, to achieve. Yes, sir. And I'm so sorry about the uh, background noise there, but uh, I, I know I can hear you a little bit. But let me ask okay. you this. Uh, what are the top three schools right now in District 6? I'd look into that more. I have some statistics on... Uh, outcomes uh, and for students, um, you know, and it's some of that is we have a, a list of elementary schools, a couple of middle schools, and high schools. I'm not sure if it's fair to come, you know, compare apples and oranges with the uh, different levels of schools. Um, I know there's some some great schools and some neighborhood schools. I know that within schools there are different outcomes as well, and different programs, and so. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's a good question, but something I have to look into even further. Um, I do want to be a representative for District 6, and on my website, I have a place for everyone to leave comments and send questions. And so I'm really out now trying to knock on doors, listen, and learn. Um, but once on the board, I think the board really has a responsibility to the entire county. So I'll try to you know, balance both those hats, be a, a listening station for District 6, and represent the full so let me ask you this, Eric. Okay, what outcomes in the past that you have seen that have actually helped move District 6 forward? Um, so I know there are some school choice in District 6, uh, some uh, for students to um, be in different types of programs in different schools. And I think it's valuable because I think education is a very personal and individual, um, not choice, but, but it's, it's very individualized. You know, how people learn, what they learn, what they, what they have passions around. Um, and I think we need more options for students to find the education style that best suits them. And um, some of that is not just having those options, but in how we communicate those options. So that's not just students, but families and communities know of them and value them. And so they're able to prepare the choice and, and find the right fit for their ch child uh, to best prepare them for the future. And I know, I know. you can't really, uh, you, you, you don't, <laughs> right now you're not on the board, so you really can't speak for many of the parents and students. But what is exactly, well, what is that ideal style for the students for District 6 right now? So I don't think there's one ideal, ideal style. I think there need to be multiple. I think there need to be opportunities for children to find the style that them and families to be empowered to use that. I think there are, uh, it comes down to some differences of resources, some in teaching style and teaching management, and some in technology. We know that there's some improving technology that allows for individualized pace of learning, um, and especially when you get into some math and sciences. And we need to be open to that. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting changes around the study of education. And uh, I am open to all ideas and all changes that lead to better student outcomes. And we, we should explore all of it. What is, your, what is your study of education as you see it right now? Um, study of education as I see it right now is in some of the hard statistics of how many third graders can read at grade level and how many eighth graders are doing algebra efficiently, how many of our graduates, how many of our students are graduating and ready for career. And that is, I think, some of the primary statistics we need to be focused on. Um, but then it gets into some of the delivery of that and some of the levels of decision making and what happens at a, a high district level versus what happens within a school and at a principal and what can happen in a classroom level. 
Uh, and some of that can be um, affected by policy and some of that can be allowed to be um, uh, flexible based on teaching style. Um, and then, you know, I've got three daughters, oh, yes. uh, 12 and 10 and, and three, um, and all very different and all very different in how they learn. And so it is on a day-to-day -day level in my house. We work with our children and speak with them and find ways to encourage them to take on new challenges and be critical thinkers and uh, be comfortable with new ideas. So what is the graduation rate right now at C.E. Williams? That's a good question. Um, I'd have to look that up. Um, it, it's, it's not where it needs to be. You know, wherever it is, it can be improved. Now, I know we know, most people in that area know the demographics of that particular school, but what's the poverty index for that school for, say, the 2021-2022 semester? Again, a really good question. I'd have to look up the exact statistics for it. I think well, you're speaking to the idea that preparing a child for education is a very layered issue, and children that are coming to school thick and tired and hungry are not in the, a, good, uh, a good space to be able to learn, and regardless of how good the teacher is, how new the school is, and how fancy the curriculum is. And so this is a community issue, and we need a lot of different support systems to ensure that there's good health outcomes, that there is proper transportation and, and good housing, so that children are well supported throughout their entire life before they get to school. And so think about early childhood education and preschools, school programming, sports, um, you, know, you know, through the city leagues. And so there's really an opportunity to ensure that the whole child is seen and, and cared for. And I want that uh, the district to, to reach out and have connections with other systems to help with the support and to be excellent in the support they provide for education during the school. So... Okay, well, what is that support system right now in District 6? Well, and it's, it's, you know, some outside of the uh, school district. You know, there's certainly uh, work with the city and city sports leagues and city parks. Um, there's some of the uh, health programs and, and out in our area, you know, the, the growing campuses of MUSC and Rover into West Ashley. Um, but, you know, I think there needs to be work on just really yeah, highlighting what are all the support services, um, where are their gaps, where do we need help? So what gaps do you see right now, currently? Um, I think there are gaps in early childhood education. In ensuring that children are ready and prepared for kindergarten and ready in the way that we currently expect kindergartners to be ready and helping to communicate that. Um, I think there are gaps in the care for children receive after school and ensuring that they have access to the district's kaleidoscope programs that has a lot of different offerings, um, private programs and nonprofits that offer well. Um, you know, I, I, I know that, to be honest, I don't know the, the, the existing food deserts in District 6, but I do know we have food deserts in Charleston County mm -hmm. and ensuring that there's proper nutrition and ability for support to dietary needs for children, I think is important. And what kind of after school programs besides, you know, kaleidoscope does District 6 currently need? currently need well i mean some of the basics of just where do kids go after school and the parents are working and there's not care is there a safe place for that child to spend hours to homework to study to just in some cases just be a kid right i mean the younger age is play is important and play is how we develop our social constructs with with our peers and with others it's where we develop leadership styles and their skills um, out of our lives. But do they have a safe place to play? 
and 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 to be kids without the stress and strain of the rest of the world. Um, I, I I don't know. I don't know that there's all there, but there's certainly some children that are falling through gaps there, and you know, helping from a school level to identify and find partners, find grants so that they can be part of Kaleidoscope um, if it's affordability to. Um, and, and in some cases, having the mental health resources within the school to help connect children that are struggling, um, whether that's with academics, whether that's with their own uh, interpersonal and development, whether it's with uh, family or, or their other parts of their community. We need to have the resources at school. Students feel safe and comfortable and have a, a competent person provide them with mental health resources. And, Mr. Eric, let me ask you this. Okay, well, with Kaleidoscope, what partners would be ideal as far as partnering with that particular, you know, organization? Um, uh, you know, I think it's pretty wide spectrum. You know, some, it's just uh, some activities that allow kids to get up and move. You know, so whether that's sports, um, dance, you know, things that allow kids to, to express themselves create, creatively. You know, with arts programs, um, to, to develop new skills and talents, and um, but but I think there could also be, you know, something to get more towards uh, things too, right? They, you know, uh, I don't know that this is offered or, or, but you know, I know getting my daughters involved in the kitchen, you know, if they help make the meal, they're more likely to enjoy it, and so when they help chop the vegetables. They enjoy the vegetables. Uh, and so they, I think there's ways you can have fun, incorporate learning, and pass along values. And, you know, I'm happy that there could be programs like that with Kaleidoscope as well. And, and, and I, my daughter, my oldest daughter, was involved in Kaleidoscope for a number of years. And I know she really enjoyed some of those programs. Wow. So, okay, I, I got to go back, obviously, to the high schools. When, when you think of, uh, obviously, <laughs> One of the high school, the number one high school right there in West Ashley is obviously West Ashley High School. What percentage of students, because I, I, I don't even know this myself, but what percentage of students at West Ashley High School actually score to see or higher on the algebra, biology, or English gateway course assessments for the end of course semesters? Again, that's a really good question to help highlight where that school is and how well the students are doing within that school. Uh, I don't know the exact statistics, and I have to go look that up. I'll get back to you on. Okay. Um, I think I think a broader cue on that is though is how do we measure uh, the health of our students academically, and what sort of tests do we use? I think we do need measures. I think we do need to utilize data in proper ways to ensure uh, our students know where they are and if they're growing. And you know, more about them as an individual. You know, I think. One test can provide um, the same measurement for every student. And so I think we need to utilize new and alternative ways to ensure that our students, um, uh, that we're able to track and measure the effectiveness of our, our academic programming for our students and make improve. And what alternative could work right now if, if you had a chance to make that decision? You know, I know that the... Um, there are data scientists within the school district. Yeah. And I'd be very curious, you know, as, as a consultant, you know, working with companies, they typically have a lot of data and how to find the right, right data to ask the right questions to learn about their business or, or their clients or their, their customer. It can be challenging sometimes you're in it. And so uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, to know that we have data scientists within the school district. I mean, just to know them better and know about how that's being improved um, and what best practices are working around the country to do that. Um, because I, I think at the end of the day, it'll be a mix of test scores. It'll be a mix of grades and some other form of engagement data to, to measure how well not just are our kids showing up to school, but how are they um, participating in the, in the education process? What is that education process for these kids today? 
Well, you know, and I think that's that's a very different question by person and by family and and by community expectations of education and whether it's that these children are meant to excel academically grade-wise has implications for where they want to go to college or what they have in the career. Um, I, I want that our community values overall excellent education. And, and in, in, in that, I mean that we need problem solvers that in the future will be working on, on problems that, that don't exist yet. You know, we're working with a lot of startups, we're seeing changes in industries and technology a greater pace than ever. I think their children now will be working in industries that don't currently exist yet and in new types of jobs that we've never thought. Of. And we need them to be prepared to be innovative and not just solve problems, but to teach themselves new skill sets. And so part of our education system needs to be giving them the tools and resources to reinvent themselves in their career a number of times. This is kind of slightly off topic because I'm right nearby, but let me go to 75 Calhoun Street once again because let me talk to you about the Charleston County School Board. I know you talked about the values for the communities and schools. What values does this board need to reinvent themselves? This board needs the values of uh, coming together with some mutual aligned um, parent concern over childhood education and childhood outcomes, and that being the primary goal. I think there needs to be work for us to um, together as individuals uh, to look and see each other as, as humans and people that care about their community and ways that we can connect over our shared concerns of our education. I think as you build relationships, it makes it more effective to have difficult conversations. So knowing that not all the school board will agree on every topic to build an effective relationship allows you to be the other person, to hear their opinion, and to then make um, arguments with and against important. But in the, in the end, it does need to come back to outfit outcome board that can agree. And I know there are going to still be some current school board members on the school board once the new board, the new board that is comes in. What particular values do you share with those current school board members right now as far as policies and decisions that they've made as a recent? Uh, I'm set to do some training with the current school board on the uh, Council for Greater City Schools and some of the work they're doing as consultants. Um, that group is uh, former superintendents and school board members and some current superintendents and school board members from large cities across the United States, and they work with the board or with their board um, to help set goals. Um, and uh, a lot of what they have been working on with them really aligns with my idea of how I'm excited to work there. I've heard it's had nice, uh, valuable implications. They're working together and with each other. Because okay. um, right at the end of the day, I think everyone, everyone running for school board um, it, it should have children's best interest at heart. And you know, the school board members and that, that any, I think it's valuable. Now, I know now, that, Eric, you personally have free children right now in schools. Are they inside Charleston County Schools? The oldest one is. Yes, she's in seventh grade. Okay. Um, 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 my middle daughter, my bonus daughter, is in a private school, okay. and it was a choice for her. For her, um, but I also recognize that it's, um, we're in a, it, a good, we're in a position to be able to make choice. Not all families are. So we want to make sure there are also good choices, um, in all schools for different children, and the youngest one is three, and so yeah. now she's in preschool. <laughs> Yes, indeed. And, and let me go back to the board, because obviously I want to talk to you about the proposal that they have right now, which is to basically give the day-to-day -day operations and all these other issues to the superintendent. I know that the items being turned over to the superintendent are essentially items that still needs the board approval. How do they make this make sense, sir? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know if I understood your question. 
Yeah, I, I know we, we talked earlier about obviously the board basically proposing the del uh, basically delegating the majority of the policy decisions to the superintendent. And I know that most of the items being turned over to the superintendent are essentially items that still need the board's approval. So how do they make this make sense? You know, I think it's a process, and I think that it become you know a learning organization that reflect you know the rest of the school district, the board, and the superintendent need to work on ways to improve how they separate duties, how they separate what requires approval or not, um, and so I expect that will change. I don't think. And I know the board has still not obviously uh, started a new superintendent search, but is according to some people ready to dictate exactly how the new board will conduct the search should that search just be left for the new board to take care of well, i think that the current board has started interviewing uh, search firms to go out and okay. find it and so i'm not sure um, the status of that process okay. um you know i think the current board is very interested in it and uh i expect that they would be you know, working to have their input on who the next superintendent would be, um, knowing that it, the next person wouldn't be hired until at least the spring. Um, I think they also recognize that they won't make the final decision. So appropriate for them to try to have an influence on it at this point, and then hopefully, um, you know, it, uh, relay races are won and lost in the handoff, right? They're getting the baton to the next person, and so hopefully getting it ready to pass the work and the duty on to the next board. I'm, I'm thankful there will be some current board members continuing uh, to have some continuity of leadership and some experience on the role and to prepare the next board. Yes, sir. And I know the board is also proposing, reportedly they're proposing that potential board candidates be trained in their new governance concept. Are there any examples of this in any other county in South Carolina? That's a good question. Not that I know of, not that there isn't, but that I know of. Okay. And I know by dividing the manuals into the board and the superintendent, are they really creating a new govern, governing structure with this? I hope so. I hope so. Um, I, mean, I think that um, superintendents, you know, like CEOs of, of company before management and administration of duties, a board should be for long-term vision, governance, guidance. And so to have a board into the weeds of uh, the administration, yeah, I think it's ineffective, uh, inappropriate. So if the board and the superintendent are to have a partnership, uh, Eric, then how should the policies be aligned and actually followed by the law of South Carolina? Well, yeah, I think there's work to be done to ensure that uh, manuals and policies, and as you split them, meet laws and, and uh, guidance and, and uh, policies uh, at a state and local level. Um, and you know, if those if there are disagreements with that, well, then that's you know requires more change, you know, policies and, and law. Certainly, looking to follow all state regulations. Um, and and I know yeah. And I, and I know earlier you you mentioned CEOs, and I know that I understand that you are a leader of the Charleston Shared Future. What exactly does that group do? Charleston Shared Future has changed a little over time. We got together initially, uh, starting back in 2018, a group of 30 or so uh, leaders across the community, teachers, uh, principals, administrators, parents, uh, grandparents, um, business leaders, uh, civic leaders. Uh, to write four scenarios about what the future of education could look like in Charleston and not to be prescriptive of what it should look like, just to start telling stories, maybe inspire a vision of what could happen in Charleston, both positive and negative, um, with different um, choices that we make. And uh, since then, the group has been working to utilize those scenarios and their community involvement to get more people involved and engaged in the education process and the education conversation in Charleston. And so now we work to have community conversations focused around education. We hosted some earlier this year uh, and last year about ESSER funding and how that should be used. 
uh, we'll host some coming up um, that uh, will not be me, but will be our members uh, talking about the school board, uh, the importance we want uh, of the community to place on these. So we want more parents, community members, be aware that there's a school board election to understand why it's important and to be able to do their research for the candidates in their district. So we'll continue on that and find uh, multiple ways to just uh, to try to get it exciting to talk about education and get more people to, to realize the significance. And I know, obviously, when you, you think about the reimagined schools proposal, I know that the Social Venture Partners is basically what the Coastal Community Foundation for my research. If you were on the board today, Mr. Eric, would you have approved of the reimagined schools proposal to take over 23 schools in Charleston County? Uh, I don't know that I can give a simple yes or no answer. I think that uh, we know that our, our current school system is um, is failing and a number of our schools are not providing the outcomes that we deserve. Something needs to change. And I'm open to what that change is. Um, but how it looks or how it's called, I don't know. But it absolutely does need to change. I would have given that proposal um, significant attention and uh, looked at um, how we could have utilized it best. And obviously, it's coming up, what, you have almost, well, I guess 40, 48, 49 days, close to 50 days left before the election. And I know right. there's a lot of people coming out with endorsements and whatnot. Let me ask you this. I know the Coalition for Kids were supporting candidates back in 2018. Would you accept their support if they called you? I would. I've been involved with Coalition for Kids since 2018. Um, was a founding member of their group and have donated to the organization. I think it's important more of our community um, involved in you know, realizing the importance of the school board and uh, that we have you know, great candidates running. Um, you know, ideally, you know, this becomes a very uh, highly contested role every year you know, with great candidates that are all focused on great educational outcomes for our children. Now, now, going back to, as you mentioned, outcomes, with the proposals that they have right now, 75 Cal Calhoun Street, how will those outcomes be the best for the students? Well, we'll look at that, Don, you know, going back to some basics of just third graders learning to read at grade level. And that's important because, you know, up until third grade, they're learning how to read. After third grade, they're reading to learn. And so if they're behind going into fourth grade, then they're struggling on, you know, from then on out. Um, being able to do algebra by eighth grade you know, is another you know, great leading indicator of their math and critical skills. And being graduating and then on graduation, being ready for a career. You know, that's, I think, one of the basics of student out. And if you were to be elected to the Charleston County School Board, what would you do on the, at the first meeting? I would shake everybody's hands, look at them in the eye, thank them for their service and, you know, work that we challenge ourselves to, to dig in, uh, do the, the hard work and get the features they deserve. And, and obviously at that particular board meeting will be the superintendent. Would you keep the current interim superintendent, Do uh, Donald Kennedy? I would, yes. Okay. Well, to be continued. Uh, Eric Dome, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you, Quentin. I appreciate you having me. Well, you're very welcome anytime.